my earliest readerhood that I always thought it was the greatest thing that anyone could do would be to bring you into their world and bring it to life and make the ordinary world uh, just disappear, just disappear to where when you close that book, you come back and you're like, oh, wow, yeah, that's right, I'm here, but wow, it was sure fun being those people, being that guy and that. So that's what I wanted to, that's what I wanted to create. I wanted to create a book that was as, um, as uh, involving um, as uh, a thriller or a fictional drama, and, uh, but would also teach you about the law. And I, I, I had a book that, there was a book that I really liked um, that I read before I went into law school. It was called um, The Buffalo, Buffalo Creek Disaster, which was about a bunch of uh, people who were killed by a coal mine company in West Virginia and the lawyers who battled to get them justice. And it was it, it combined those elements of being detailed about the law and procedure and exactly what was going on to where it was just not smoothed over or made to seem anything less than it was, but was also really exciting. And I, I kind of trust the reader that much. And I, I might lose some readers, but I'd rather have that readership of people who uh, say, yeah, I really do think I understand uh, how a civil lawsuit to recover stolen assets works and, uh, and why, why if somebody stole your stuff, you might just want to go to court and sue. You know? Now, I mean, I'm just thinking back with my involvement with this story. I remember interviewing... <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I remember... <laughs> Interviewing Ron Levy about it uh, sometime in, I think, 99. I met Stephen Michael Cohen in January 99, and he gave me his business card saying Stephen Michael Cohen sex.com. And I said, How did you, how do you have sex.com? Or how long have you had sex.com? And he said, Since 1979. And I said, Were there dot coms around then? And he, he gave some very smooth explanation and it just left me befuddled but I didn't really think about it uh, and then I interviewed him in January of 99 and he's a great interview I'm not saying he's telling the truth but he's he's, he's very glib and uh, then I don't recall getting involved until somehow Sue Watley came my way and then Sue became like my best friend we were talking all the time and she was like giving me the the update, and she was working for Charles Carry On, I think, or with Charles Carry On, and but you and I, I think we we maybe only spoke once before the the main Judge Ware ruling giving Gary back sex dot com. Is that does that sound right? Maybe once or twice. Gosh, I, you know what? I my recollection is that I never spoke with you until after the case happened and until after the whole debacle with Gary. But I know that's when I met you personally. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think you're, you're probably right. Because I, I yeah, did like and Sue, and Sue was a total pipeline to what was going on. Sue told yeah, me everything. Sue was, yeah, the voice, yeah. She was, she, well, she found her media here. You know, yeah. for a person who was born in, in Sweet Home, Oregon, and um, who uh, weighed about 130 pounds more than your average sex kitten, she uh, did a pretty good job of uh, work in the industry for all it was worth. And, uh, yeah, she, she definitely gave us a line on what was going on. And I, you know, I knew about you, and, of course, I read everything that you wrote about it and, and commented on it in the book. The, uh, the, the, I, I think I, I referred to you uh, when, you, when you quoted Gary uh, as saying that, uh, well, let's see, in the deposition they asked him, does anybody call you anything else? And he said, big dummy. Yeah. It was a classic case of, you know, self-deprecating geek humor when transposed over to the adult industry was, you know, it was like self-impalement. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't do that in adult. You know, you do not make fun of yourself. You, you don't. You know, not in any way that could be used against you. And uh, he hadn't learned that lesson. And I think uh, you quoted it. And all you did was quote it. Yeah. Uh, but I think I, I said something like, it takes a journalist, which is probably not entirely fair to you since 
All you did was quote. <laughs> oh, that was fine. I, I mean, I don't even recall because ninety nine percent of the stuff I write, I don't recall. It's it's done by instinct, and I, I mean, I wasn't staying awake night thinking about sex dot com. It's just the story would come to me, and and I would shovel it out. And so, yeah, I think you're right. I don't think we spoke before. Now, how many times have we met in person? Twice. I believe twice. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, twice. I think twice. So we, we've been acquainted with each other for a decade, but we've only met in person twice, and we, we've spoken on the phone a handful of times. Right. Yeah. And it looks like it looks like your journalistic focus has shifted away from the quote unquote industry. And yeah, I stopped writing oh, about the industry eighteen months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I hope this doesn't drag you back into the depraved territory. <laughs> And, and, yeah, when I picked up the book, uh, I really had no interest in sex.com. Uh, I really have very limited interest left in the, in the pornography industry. And, and, but I picked it up, and I, I started scanning through it, and, and I went to the point where you, started, where you got sex.com, and now you're going to operate it, and you talk about meeting Yishai Habari. And then I thought, yeah. holy cow, this is fascinating because Yishai has a mythical role in the porn online industry. He's someone that very few people have met and know well. He he is a confirmed has been a confirmed partner with organized crime. And and I always regarded him as as someone with very strong connections who works hand in glove with organized crime, which which has been revealed. I was basically the only person to write that. Nobody else had the yeah. role to write that. And, yeah. and thanks to me, eventually some other people in the mainstream, uh, Mike Brooker or Bunker or Brunker on MSNBC eventually reported that angle. But the Serge Berber also worked closely with Ishai for, for a while. And I was stunned that that you guys, the white hat guys, gave your sex.com to this guy who was mobbed up. Yeah, well... What, what was going on there? <laughs> it, well, what was going on was that I was the classic case of the guy who lands a fish so big that it sinks his boat. Yeah. You know, it, I had no idea what I was doing, and I have, you know, I have tried to avoid that modus operandi ever since. Uh, I was simply focused on it from almost, you would say, a technical point of view. Which is, yeah. can I, as a legal matter, wrest this domain away from the man who stole it? And the answer was yes. And I, I left it to Gary and Sue to figure out what we would do with it. I had not the first idea about what the industry uh, had as its real profit model. I I didn't have any insight into it whatsoever, and so when we suddenly found ourselves in control of it, uh, I the, I didn't realize it, but the power shifted entirely from my hands to the hands of people who had knowledge, like Gary, and uh, he said, "Well, let's let's just uh, let's just have Yishai Hibari do it." Well, according to according to Steve Cohen, who's talked to me about it since, he, he was already in business with Yishai. Yeah. So, for sex.com to, to, stay, to stay with Steve Cohen's partner, and then, you know, the irony of it was is that Yisha was instantly making 15%, and, you know, that, that was my share. So, basically, just for being the bag man, he was getting 15%. But, uh, and, you know, I had to work for 20 months and, uh, and take a big flyer on the whole thing, and, uh, you know, but like I said in the book, you know, if I could have hooked up a job like Yisha's, I would have never been a lawyer. But, uh, Mike, you know, a, a person does, in fact, have, have a, a gut feeling about some things. And after a day spent with Yishai and his partners, I felt terrible. I yeah. just felt terrible. And it did, not, it did not let up. There was something that, was, that I, I couldn't get over, and I just went into uh, an obsessive spiral about getting out of business with Yishai Hibari. That was my, and, uh, and I was writing. I was writing on my website that this is a guy who's mobbed up. 
I mean, I wasn't just whispering this to people. I was writing this on my website. This is a guy with with mafia connections, and and you you knew the the, the stories about Ishai. Um, 